Hey, welcome to Lucky Week 13. Well, this week we're talking about inosilicates. Those are the chain silicates. And this is the second to the last lecture. So uh, no matter how bad it is, hey, it's almost over. Well, this shot shows a mantle xenolith from Hawaii. And of course, in Hawaii, there are some magmas that come rocketing up from mantle depths, and they actually tear loose some of the surrounding rocks from the melt zone, and they show us what the mantle looks like. This one dominantly is the green mineral there, and uh, which you all should know as olivine, right? And that's what sort of dominates the, 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 the look when you see something like this, that beer bottle green kind of color. But mixed in with that, in about a 20 to 25 percent proportion is the dark mineral and most of that dark mineral is the mineral pyroxene. Now pyroxene is a group of minerals that we'll talk about today. Um, pyroxenes of course are one type of inosilicate, another type is the amphiboles. But of the pyroxenes there are many varieties the one that you know the best, the one that you would have seen already, the one that would, is made available to you in intro is the mineral augite. Well, anyway, very, very, very important mineral um, in many, many, many different kinds of rocks. It's very common, and uh, the inosilicates, of course, are a very uh, uh, important uh, group. Um, they contain a lot of different elements, some of them do, so their chemical formulas get a little get a little out of hand. But for the most part, they're really pretty straightforward to identify. They're beautiful under the microscope. And uh, as you can see from this, uh, the mantle is made of the stuff. So uh, if we're going to understand the planet, of course, we need to understand the pyroxenes. Well, moving on, remember this? Yeah, these are the chemical formulas that we have already covered. And as you go back and look at the mineral groups we have covered, we've covered the framework silicates, the tectosilicates, and we've covered the phyllosilicates, the sheet silicates. And of course, the sheet silicates get pretty wacky because they got all of those places to put different elements, right? In the centers of those rings of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, the sheets of, um, of tetrahedra. Um, we're going to be adding to this list this week. So um, these are the objectives we have for today's lecture. We are going to review the general attributes of the anosilicates. You know, we're going to introduce the single chain structure that forms the pyroxenes. We're going to look at the optical and physical parameters of the common pyroxenes. Then we'll look at the common occurrences. Where are we going to see them? Now, then we'll do the same thing with the amphiboles, basically introduce the double chain structure that forms the amphiboles. We'll look at the optical and physical parameters of the common amphiboles and look at where they occur. Well, the single chains, two of the four oxygen atoms that are in the tetrahedra, right? Remember, these everything starts with the silica tetrahedra. So when we get ino, the, 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 all inos are chains, but the single chains, which are going to be the pyroxene group for the most part, two of the four are linked. So when we look at this line of silica tetrahedra, we can see that this one is linked to this one, this one's linked to this one, and so they give you sort of the parameters here, and they say, well, if we look at two of these, right? And you count up the number of oxygen atoms. Now remember, the, these two actual oxygens are linked to the next one, so we can only use half of those. It turns out to be a 1 to 3 ratio, right? Because there's a total of 7, two of those are shared, that means it's a 2 to 6 or 1 to 3 when it comes down to silica to oxygen. Now, it's not just the pyroxenes that lie in these single chains. There's also a group of minerals that are called the peroxenoids. And um, a peroxenoid, as you would imagine, is something very close to a pyroxene. You know, kind of like a feldspathoid was very close to a feldspar, right? Little different crystal structure. I can't call it a pyroxene, 
but it's close enough to be called a peroxenoid. And we'll get to that. Um, for those of you that know your minerals, the mineral will last tonight is uh, one of these found in scarn deposits, usually, where we've had silica-rich fluids uh, getting intimate with uh, limestone. Well, in the double chains, all we do is we link those single chains, join them up side by side. So here, single chain, so these two guys, right, link with another side, and we, 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 we bring them all together. And what that does is half of our tetrahedra are sharing three oxygens. So look at this guy right here, right? He's got one, two, three shared, whereas the other half only share two, like we saw over in the single chains, right? So like this one is only sharing two. And when you do that, the ratio comes out to be four to 11. And that's going to be the amphibole group. Now, the amphibole group is going to be much more chemically complex than the pyroxene group because of this linking and you can see what results are some of these larger holes that then as you know in other minerals we've talked about we can we can place some uh, uh, bigger uh, more unloved elements. Now all inosilicates are biaxial so you put in the gypsum plate I mean uh, when you put in the analyzer and you go to get a figure, you're going to see those curved isogyres, right, telling you that you're not looking at something that is uniaxial. And that's the place to start, right? As you guys get better and better at looking at these minerals in lab, you'll see that you start in plain light. And you're like, well, okay, I got a pleochroic mineral. A pleochroic mineral cannot be, um, you know, isometric right? or isotropic. Um, and then you start looking around and you start figuring out what you got. But all of them are biaxial, and most of them are going to be monoclinic. There's a few orthorhombic ones. And remember, orthorhombic has higher symmetry, right? If, if that's the shoebox. And when you can't fit everything into the shoebox, then you tweak one corner and you end up with monoclinic. So we don't really see, there's no triclinic. Um, now, as soon as I said that, you can probably dig one weird one up somewhere. But for the most part, they're going to be um, monoclinic and some orthorhombic. So biaxial minerals, all of them. Over on the left, we have a classic pyroxene. And when you look end on, the C-axis would be sticking out the end here, right? So when we look at a section cut parallel to 001, that would be this, looking straight down the C-axis. And we see cleavage that's almost 90 degrees. And then over here in the amphibole, we see, again, the same kind of section, right? Looking straight down the C-axis here, we see uh, uh, cleavages that are at 124 and 56. These are actually not at 90. They're at, uh, what, 83 and uh, uh, 97? Yeah, something like that. So, um, but this is the way you identified them in intro, right? You looked at them. They were both dark. They were both shiny. They were both hard, but one of them had, if you really were following the rules, one of them had almost 90 degree cleavage, the other one didn't. And you know what? It's really not going to be that different identifying them under the microscope. When you get this sort of view on the side, it's difficult. Pyroxenes tend to be chubbier, blockier, more equant. Amphiboles tend to be longer, more needle shaped. Yeah, not always. But on the end views, it's a dead giveaway. These cleavages are, are, are almost 90. These cleavages give you this diamond-shaped pattern, and that's a dead giveaway. There's other things as well, like pleochroism, and then you can really dig in and, and, and with the stuff that you already know. Okay? So more or less, you get the same cations in each. You get iron, you get magnesium, you get calcium, but... Amphiboles contain OH, and you remember the OH, right? That hydroxyl ion, right? That's going to be water, you know, more, right? And where do you think that water's going? Bing! Yes, you got it right. It's going in those, those holes left between the joined single chains. And um, now in order to get that water in there, we've got to leave off some other stuff, which makes the, the, the chemical formulas get a little more complicated. 
And it's not just water. Amphiboles also can contain potassium. They can also contain sodium. And, and I like to tell the class that, they, that, that something like a horn blend, it's a real garbage can when it comes to putting stuff in there, which, which makes horn blends and other amphiboles very useful in the petrology world because certain horn blends only form and I say horn blend kind of is, is a synonym for amphiboles, but, but certain amphiboles only form under certain pressures. You'll get a certain composition, right? So their composition is tied to pressure or their composition is tied to temperature. And this is what creates geothermometers and geobarometers. You know, a mineral like quartz, well, it forms everywhere from the surface all the way down. And so you're like, if I've got quartz, I know I'm on Earth. Whereas when you have specific amphiboles, you can really kind of forensically pinpoint where they were formed. And that is very useful. Okay, so like I said before, pyroxenes tend to form these stubby little prisms. And over here on the left, you can see these little blocky grains inside this pyroxenite. Well, that's nice, isn't it? That's an igneous rock composed of 90% or more pyroxene, a pyroxenite. Wow, that's, that's, that's easy. A peroxenite is another example of a peridotite. That is a mantle rock. The other rock that I showed you earlier on, that rock contained more olivine than pyroxene. So you're going to find out that there are peroxenites called, or um, uh, peridotites, things are called whirlites. Uh, there's going to be um, you know, all sorts of funny names. Lurzolites, uh, Websterites. Um, but that's all petrology, right? Ooh, not my, not my uh, 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 deal here. Over here on the right, what we see is an andesite named after, you got it, the Andes Mountains in South America. And uh, speaking of which, uh, next semester, boy, I'll be able to teach volcanology again. And won't that be a relief? Anyway, we have a andesite here, and the large phenocris, right, are all amphibole. Those are all hornblend. And um, they could be oxyhornblend, which is a hornblend that contains a little more oxidized uh, oxygen, and it's, um, you, you, they end up kind of reddish brown. But very distinctive and very easy to pick out with this lighter gray ground mass background, yeah? Over here, the pyroxene, it just looks like a big lump of rock. But that is going to be some heavy stuff. That's going to be a really dense rock. Mantle density, you know, 4. This, 2.7, 2.8. Okay? And like I told you before, the other really distinctive quality between these two, which I don't know if anybody ever pointed out to you why this is the case. But of course, today that information is coming to you. Almost 90, 93 and 87 for the pyroxenes, 124 and 56 for the amphiboles. Okay, well, where do we see these forming? Well, pyroxenes are a higher temperature mineral. When you have a magma that's cooling down from its hottest temperatures, so um, remember, on, and I put Bowen's reaction series in here for the, all of you, because you will be going to petrology next semester, and this kind of stuff is bread and butter for you. Anyway, the first mineral to cool upon, you know, the, 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 the magma cooling, if you have the right constituents, right, if you have a, the, right, the right elements, would be olivine. So in a magma like you see in Hawaii, the first mineral to grow typically is olivine. And then olivine gives way to pyroxene. And I like this particular bones because you notice how these arrows overlap. The first pyroxene doesn't form after the olivine has stopped growing. You actually start to get pyroxene growing along with the olivine. And you will have, if you went to Hawaii with me, we looked at some rocks and you will have seen rocks that have olivine and pyroxene in them. So it's not that the olivine just didn't disappear, it's just both can grow equally and they're both in equilibrium at the very same time. But notice what happens is, in order before amphibole starts to form, the olivine is already gone. So if you can grow olivine, then eventually pyroxene starts to grow, the olivine will disappear before the amphibole starts. You shouldn't 
usually see rocks that have amphibole and olivine and pyroxene, at least where the olivine is happy. Okay, that's why they call this a discontinuous series of crystallization, because some of these minerals are using the other minerals to grow. They're using their elements, right? One is forming at the expense of the other. Now, over on the right-hand side of the diagram, we have calcium-rich plagioclase giving way to sodium-rich plagioclase, and what we would see is a continuous series of crystallization, but the plagioclase is changing composition. It's going from more anorthite rich, right, that's high AN content, down to low AN content, sodium rich. And remember, plagioclase can do this because it's a solid solution series, right? The plagioclase stays there, but it changes its composition. Over on the left-hand side, what we see are minerals. Some of them, like olivine, have a pretty wide range of operation. It's also a solid solution series mineral from magnesium to iron rich, but eventually it gives way to pyroxene, finally giving way to amphibole, biotite. Then down here we see potassium feldspar, muscovite, and quartz. Now another interesting thing about this diagram is that it is the order that we spoke of these minerals. Remember, we talked about quartz and potassium feldspar first. Those are the tectosilicates, the framework silicates. Then we talked about biotite. Yeah, I know muscovite's mixed in down here, but we talked about biotite. That is a sheet silicate. Now, today, we're talking about inosilicates, which is the amphiboles and pyroxenes. And then next week, the final lecture will be about olivine, and that's the nesosilicates. So I did that on purpose, right? We talk about them. And, and so if you're going to grow them, they go in the reverse order, neso. I know, phylo, tecto. Pretty cool, right? And then amphiboles, of course, I meant to point out before I got on that long soliloquy, um, that they form next in the cooling magma. Now, why? What, what is it about amphibole that makes it start to form at a cooler temperature than pyroxene? Well, water is the key, okay? The water that was able to, to get it, the OH, right, that was able to get in there in those large uh, uh, holes that were created by the combining single chains, and that's what it takes. And at too hot a temperature, right, you drive off the water. Same thing happens in metamorphic rocks. At lower grades of metamorphism, you're going to see things like clays giving way to sheet silicates like muscovite. Muscovite will give way eventually to things like potentially like uh, uh, chain silicates, amphiboles of different varieties. Then they give way to higher temperature minerals, uh, even tectosilicates that do not have any water in them. So water is the key here, right? Water is the big thing that separates amphiboles from pyroxenes. And amphiboles do contain a lot of other elements because they have a more complex crystal structure because of that double chain thing going on. Neat, huh? Okay. Now, the other thing about this is if you have, and this is, this is stuff that's petrology, and normally in my career, right, I, got, I taught everybody mineralogy, then we went on to teach, I went on to teach them petrology, but, but you'll have a different petrology teacher. Um, so here's the cool thing. Let's say you had a magma, uh, like that andesite I showed you that had the um, hornblende little phenocrysts in it. Well, here's a hornblende phenocryst inside some type of andesite. Could be a dacite or an andesite. You know, a dacite is just a little more silica rich than an andesite. Well, what's surrounding this hornblende crystal here is a rim of finely gran granulated pyroxene and then some iron oxides. And so we call that a reaction rim. And if you take a magma that was growing hornblende, and hornblende requires water, okay, and then let's say you dehydrated the melt. Basically, you let gases release, like the magma moves up to a shallow temp pressure, and, and you see the gases that are streaming out of an active volcano. Well, that gas is coming from somewhere. It's not necessarily just, you know, like snow being melted. Okay, if it's coming out of the magma, what you can do is dehydrate the magma 
And then what happens is the horn blend's no longer stable and it recrystallizes to a rim of pyroxene, which is a very similar mineral minus the water and some iron oxides. Pretty cool, right? So this is the kind of texture that you can use that you guys will be learning in petrology to put your optical skills to work. So again, even if you didn't have any chemical information or anything like that, you can start to talk about some of these other processes that you wouldn't ever be able to know or understand if you didn't know how to work that microscope, which is why, you know, we've worked so hard to teach you. Anyway, and the opposite will happen too, right? So let's say you have a magma and all of a sudden you get a fresh infusion of, uh, of water, you can turn your pyroxenes and all of a sudden you'll see a reaction rim of amphiboles around the rim. Pretty neat. Okay, so let's get on and talk about just the pyroxene details, then we'll do the same thing with amphiboles. So, pyroxene details. Now, you're always going to notice in a pyroxene formula either SiO3, which again, when you do the math here, each oxygen is minus 2, so that's minus 6. Each silicon is plus four, so we have a minus two charge here, right? And that's what we were left over with when we did our silica tetrahedras bonding to each other. Now, sometimes you're going to see them doubled up. You're going to see this multiplied by two algebraically. It's okay. It's the same thing, right? We have Si2O6, and then you have a minus four charge because we doubled it, okay? We do that because then we don't have any fractions, and you're going to see that some pyroxenes it's okay to use SiO3, other times it's easier to go Si2O6. But when you see that tacked onto a formula, you're going to know that it's a pyroxene of some sort. All right, now here, in order to, to, to balance out this charge, um, what you're going to need is to get rid of that minus 2 charge. And so let's take a look at one tetrahedra right here. Okay, so there's one silica tetrahedra. It's bonded to one, two, three, plus two atoms. Mm -hmm. Each one of those uh, is giving it a two-thirds charge, and when you add up those two-thirdses, right, two-thirdses? Anyway, three two-thirdses equals a minus two, and uh, you can balance it out. But that's the way it works. Now, I wish it was this simple. The structure was this simple. It was kind of this simple in sheet silicates, it's not quite so simple in the chain silicates because they, we have to actually stack these up. But don't worry, you know, it, it, it's one of those things where um, um, we're going to see each one of these positive two cations, you see the little dashes here, they're surrounded by six tetrahedra. So what we're actually seeing is some six-fold coordination, right? Those are octahedral sites because we make octahedrons out of them. Um, and you're like, huh? Don't go away. It's not that complicated. You remember the TOT structures from last week, the phyllosilicates? Well, it's kind of the same thing, but just in smashed together in miniature. But I just thought I'd show you this diagram to show you that, yes, this, the sheets, them, the, the chains themselves end up minus two, and in order to balance that out, we're going to have to chuck some cations in there. Iron, magnesium, calcium, or a mixture of all three. And um, so here's what this looks like. There's our tetrahedral single chains. And remember, they're staggered a little bit, right? We're looking down the C-axis here. You see they've got A going this way and B going this way. That means we're looking straight down the C-axis. And there's those octahedral sites, right? They're calling them M1 here because that's a place where we can put cations. And so that's where we're going to be stuffing those ca calciums, or we're going to be stuffing sodium, uh, calciums, magnesiums, or iron. Okay, octahedrally coordinated cations between those SiO3 chains. That's what I showed you up above. Putting it all together, okay, what we end up with then is we end up with something called a single I-beam. And, and, and here, that's the T-O-T, right? From the last picture, tetrahedra, octahedra, tetrahedra. And that's that kind of broken down, right? You see those, those silica tetrahedra in the single chain. There's another one upside down, sandwiched between them in octahedral coordination were those M1 cations. 
Now the other thing that they're showing you here, this is an M2 site. Sometimes when we take this, and this is this collectively is called an I-beam, right? That's it right there. And sometimes where the I-beams stack on each other, if we want to do it, we can stick some more cations in there, and that becomes the M2 site. Okay? So this is looking straight down, straight down the C-axis, and you can see the cleavages here that would result from popping these I-beams apart from each other. That's where that almost 90-degree cleavage comes from. Here's a, a little different uh, view of it, right? Now again, there's one I-beam, there's, there, there's one silica tetrahedra, right, and with the octahedra in the middle, and there's another one. And again, the way this works out, the way the cleavage works out best, is to break along between the I-beams like that. And again, this is oogite. So, all pyroxenes will have that perfect 1-1-0 cleavage, right? Cuts the A-axis at 1, cuts the B-axis at 1, does not cut the C-axis. When you look down the C-axis, the cleavages intersect at this near 90-degree angle. It's not quite 90, but it's almost, right? 87, 93. And of course, you've been using this to tell pyroxenes apart from amphiboles since you were in physical geology. All right, so there's a chunk of augite from lab, right? You can pick this thing up, and there's the C-axis is going like this, right? I've got it oriented the same as this other side. And... Um, uh, C axis would be sticking out this way and this way. And of course, you're not seeing a lot of cleavage on this end, but you would in the microscope. But these tend to make stubbier crystals, not as needle like, uh, right? And the cleavages are intersecting. These little lines you see over here, those are the cleavage intersection points. All right. So, octahedrally, say single eye beams, yeah. Okay, the pyroxene quadrilateral. Now, a quadrilateral is just a triangle with the top cut off. So this shows us in chemical space where the various pyroxenes are going to be located, right? So if you look on the bottom axis, that's the easiest one. We have MgSiO3. Remember I told you SiO3 is going to be the, you know, sign that you got a pyroxene. Okay, this is a very simple pyroxene, MgSiO3. That, the mineral name there is instatite. Now look, here they show it, because I showed you two different diagrams, they show it doubled, Mg2Si206. Remember I told you Si206 is also the same thing. On the other side, FeSiO3, that's here it is again, that's this mineral called ferrocillite. So that so instatite is one end member, ferrocillite is another end member. And in between those two, we're going to have a mixture of magnesium and iron taking those M1 cation sites. Now, they call this hypersthene, which is sort of a, 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 a solid solution between them, between instatite and ferrocillite. People don't get as picky about these as they do about the plagioclase, right? So you just, because plagioclase is super common. Okay, see, hypersthene. There's some other names. So, so the, here they're showing you ferrocillite. There, this diagram is showing you ferrocillite is everything from over here to here. This one's showing you everything that's, that's over here is hypersthene. They're not even showing you the instatite name. Um, let's go to the other corner of the triangle. The, the, the very end of the triangle up here is calcium SiO3, right? CaSiO3. That's not a pyroxene. Remember I talked about the peroxenoids. So the only pyroxenes are going to exist from this 50% line. Each one of these is 10%. So this is all magnesium, this is all iron, and this is all calcium. So to have a true pyroxene, you can only have up to 50% calcium because when you go beyond 50%, the structure gets too tweaked to fit it, and we don't call it a pyroxene anymore, right? So true pyroxenes fit in a quadrilateral that ends here at 50% calcium. So this corner is CAMG in equal proportions, and then SI206. Over here is CaFe Si206, and we call this diopside, this corner, and this corner is called Hedenbergite.
I am not making this up. See it here? That's why I included these two diagrams so that you could see these names. Okay? Hedenburg was either a town or a person, you know. Now, Wolastonite, this is the peroxenoid I mentioned to you earlier, and I'll talk about it again, again in a minute. So if you have a mineral up here, and they, the wolastonite is not uncommon. It's made where typically where you have like a uh, granite magma uh, intrudes into the crust and comes in contact with a limestone, which is pretty common, right? There's a lot of limestone out there, and when you have a magma intruding, you can get a silica-rich magma, you know, sort of forming a love child with the, uh, the limestone, and what you get is wollastonite, and this forms a lot in these scarn deposits. Those are contact metamorphic deposits, a, a mineral that is, you know, used for ceramics and, and stuff like that. Okay, uh, what else can I tell you here? Um, let's see. If we don't have, let's say, a, a, the most common pyroxene is augite. I don't know if I tell you that anywhere in here, but the reason it's the most common is if you have some magnesium, some iron, and some calcium, you end up out in here, and that is where you have augite. So here's augite. Um, another mineral in here with a funny name is called pigeonite. I'm not making it up. It's called pigeonite. And pigeonite is a very high temperature version, right? And that is a mineral that in volcanic rocks, pigeonite can exist. But remember like when we talked about uh, feldspars cooling down, at high temperatures we can have uh, alkali feldspars and plagioclase feldspars together as one mineral. And as they cool down, they immiscibly separate, right? They're, they're, they won't form together, so they come out. That's where we get X solution. And we can also see X solution in pyroxenes, all right? So pigeonite is a high temperature version that if it's frozen into a quickly cooled volcanic rock, you'll still see it. What happens if you don't quickly cool the volcanic rock and it cools slowly? Well, then that mineral will break into two minerals, an orthopyroxene down here at the bottom, hyperstene, and augite, a clinopyroxene. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. Okay, so at the bottom of the chart, the minerals that are low in calcium are called orthopyroxenes, and they're orthopyroxenes because they're orthorhombic. They have an orthorhombic crystal habit, right? They're in the orthorhombic system. And the two that you need to remember are going to be enstatite, MgSiO3, and then ferrocylite, FeSiO3. And I'll include these on the list of minerals that you need to know, right? Remember, in between them, everybody's going to call it hypersteam. See in here? Orthopyroxenes, hypersteam. So if you have an Mg, comma, FeSiO3, then that's going to be something between the instatite end member and the ferrocylite end member. Um, most of the time you don't have to worry about this stuff because you're only going to have one kind of pyroxene in your rock. But if you worked in rocks that were ultramafic, um, you might have several pyroxenes and then you have to know your pyroxenes apart. Okay, so orthopyroxenes, low calcium, they can only have 5%. See, there's the 10% mark. Right? Each one of these I told you is 10%. That's 5%. So if you have over 5% calcium, you're going to be beyond what you can be and still be an orthopyroxene. Okay? So they're low calcium. They can have some calcium, just not too much. I say they're ferromagnesian. That means there's iron and magnesium. They're all orthorhombic. So the two common ones, encetite on this end, Mg, ferrocylite on this end, Fe. Now, the clinopyroxenes are higher calcium bearing, right? They can also have, I'll show you later, they can also have sodium in them. But for this part, they have greater than 5%. So look up here, we're talking like 45 to 50% calcium, and you can still be in your diopside. So this is CAMG SI206. And if you're over here where you have more iron, right, the iron rich end member is Hedenbergite, okay? And that's CAFE. But remember, still SI206. Why the clino part? 
because all of the clinopyroxenes are monoclinic, right? By the time you shove that calcium atom in there, it tweaks the crystal structure, it can't be orthorhombic anymore, and it goes to being monoclinic. Okay, most common pyroxene you're ever going to find is going to be augite, and it is a clinopyroxene. Augite has some calcium, some iron, yeah, and it's out here in this part of the world. And again here, it says miscibility gap. You don't find pyroxenes with this composition because what would happen is you would make clinopyroxenes and you would make orthopyroxenes instead of something in here. The oil is separating from the vinegar, yeah? Unless you have pigeonite, which is, again, at very high temperature rocks, volcanic rocks, you can have pigeonite. Uh, yeah, so there are three important solid solution series contained within this quadrilateral. So you can have arranging compositions of your orthopyroxenes. That's they basically call them all hyperstein. You can have a ranging composition lotus. It's a pretty wide range, right? Of iron and magnesium here. You can have pigeonite, or you can have augite. So if it really came down to it, you're, you know, some people just only ever talk about augites, pigeonites, and hypersteam. I told you it was going to get a little more complicated, right? Remember, like, I don't know, somewhere around 30 minutes ago, all pyroxenes were augite. Well, isn't it just that way in all parts of geology? When it starts, it's kind of simple. And then as you go on, yeah, we throw in the extra details. But that's okay. Okay, this is a photomicrograph, right, showing clinopyroxenes and pigeonite. They can contain exsolution lamellae of orthopyroxene if you cool them slowly. So if you had a pigeonite in a, in a volcanic rock that started to cool down slowly, what we would see is this or orthopyroxene lamellae coming out of a clinopyroxene host. So, if you see something that looks like X solution, but you don't have a feldspar, bam, you've got yourself a pyroxene, right? Nothing else does it. It's really good. And when you look in your little uh, optical mineralogy textbook, um, you're going to see that you'll, you'll see some, some good um, textures in there. Uh, the other thing that these uh, pyroxenes can do is have simple twins. That also makes them similar to the feldspars, but way higher birefringence and pleochroism and color and all that kind of stuff, right? Higher relief. You know, you're never going to mix these up with something like a feldspar, but you're going to see similar optical properties like the uh, X solution lamellae and 20. Neat, huh? Okay. So now, clinopyroxenes, there's also another group of clinopyroxenes that were not represented on the quadrilateral, because remember, the quadrilateral was just iron, magnesium, and calcium, okay? What if you have sodium, right, as well? And uh, there's, there's plenty of sodium-bearing pyroxenes that you know of, and some of that, like jade, you know, the mineral jadeite. Uh, that's a sodium and aluminum, right? So if we take away a silicon, remember there was SI306? Okay, well now we have SI206, but it's ALSI206. Remember, we, we just like we did with the feldspars, we put an aluminum in there instead of a silicon in one of those tetrahedral sites. Well, then we can substitute in a sodium. Over here, it's sodium and iron. Over here, it was sodium and aluminum. Down here, it's calcium, magnesium, iron, and silicon. Over here, it's calcium, aluminum. Whew. Still showing augite, nothing, fan nothing special, right? But now it can have a little aluminum in it. There was no aluminum in this diagram. Um, if you have, uh, there, there's a mineral called omphacite. It forms in eclogites. These are, the, these are very, very high pressure mafic rocks. So if you had like a, a basalt and you buried it down to mantle pressures and temperatures, it turns. This is what happens with the, the subducting oceanic plate when it goes down into the mantle, right? You turn basalts into eclogites. And one of the minerals that's an eclogite is omphacite. It's a green um, pyroxene. Pretty cool, right? Anyway, 
So just thought I'd let you know that, that it, the, 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 uh, the plot thickens even further if you happen to, to run into any of these things. Again, they follow all of the same pyroxene habits, 87, 93 cleavage and all the other stuff, but we can stuff in some, remember I told you those M2 sites? We can get some sodium in there, yeah, and, um, but it makes it, and calcium in those spots too. Okay, so I say here, in order to fit some sodium in the structure, some of those silicons have to be replaced by aluminums. And the sodium is way too big to fit, you know, inside uh, those tetrahedral or even those M1 sites. They go in those M2 sites where we, uh, we saw those I-beams sandwiched together. Oh, what a great professor. I showed you a picture of it again. Remember the M2 sites I said? Okay, so this is where that sodium would go up in here. Okay, where the I beams are stuck onto another I beam. Those are those M1 sites. That's where all the iron, magnesium, and calcium is going that we saw in this diagram. Ta da! Okay. All right, finally, to finish up the pyroxene part, we're, remember the pyroxenoids. Well, I told you elastinite was one. That's calcium, silicon, and oxygen. And there's another mineral called rhodonite, and that's magnesium. That's manganese, right? M-N, not M-G. Manganese, silicon, and oxygen. And those are peroxenoids. And look at the difference. So here's a pyroxene, right? There's our single chain. But look at what's happened with wellastonite. The chain is sort of bent, and we got another tetrahedra stuck in there. So we've widened the gap between these connector chains, right? to 7.1 from 5.2, and we do it one more with rhodonite. So these are single chains, right? They still are chain silicates, but they're modified too much to call them pyroxenes, so they're peroxenoids. Um, I found this chart, and it show you, shows you some nice uh, simple chemical formulas, right? So here's your magnesium iron, enstatite. Mg2Si206 or MgSiO3. Yeah. Ferrocillite. There's pigeonite. But what we're seeing is the same cations, right? Some of these are ortho, you know, pyroxenes, and this one, the pigeonite, we, we actually got some calcium in there. Then the calcium pyroxenes, we got augite, diopside, hedenbergite. Yeah. Then we got some of those sodic pyroxenes, pyroxenes the agerine, augite, omphacite that I showed you. There's jadeite. Yeah. And we can actually have a lithium pyroxene. So uh, Dr. Monk, she loves her lithium. And um, what we'll see in pegmatite sometimes is spodumene. And uh, it's if you have enough lithium and you have enough of this stuff left over, we can actually take and make a lithium-bearing pyroxene called spodumene. And, of course, that big old fat lithium uh, atom is going to have to be stuffed into one of those M2 sites. Yeah? Okay. Whoa! What is this? Ah, this is nothing. I found this online, thought I'd show it to you. You know, you never know. You never know if you guys are going to be working in uh, for a petrology place and need to figure this stuff out. But this is kind of a flow chart, right? So let's say you're cruising along under your microscope. And you notice you have a mineral that has two cleavages intersecting at almost 90. And you're like, well, it's colored. It's got, and then the colored stuff, maybe it doesn't change when you turn the stage, or maybe it does. Well, what color is it? What rock is it formed in? And, and this is what's going on here. Or is it a colorless pyroxene? Because there's lots of colorless pyroxenes as well as colored pyroxenes. So you can see, well, I've got omphacite, and I've got a, a general ortho. OPX is sort of, that's like, you know, what we were talking about, hypersteam, right? And here's the different compositions where we have instant, how much, how much of our magnesium version do we have in there? Here's Hedenbergite, here's omphacite, here's diopside, here's pigeonite, here's augite, right? So anyway, this is kind of a um, uh, psychotic flow chart. Um, but knowing what you know, it's not that hard to figure out. Anyway, Stuff like this is available if you were to need it. All right, let's move on. Amphibole. So, Amphibole's formula, SI411, remember I told you that at the beginning, half of these tetrahedra, silica tetrahedra, are sharing two oxygens. There's one, there's two. 
and the other half are sharing three. So I circle the three, right? There's one, two, three bearings shared. And when you figure this all out and you total up how many are being shared and how many oxygens you have and then how many silicons you have, it turns out to be a ratio of four to 11. And just like we did with the pyroxene, sometimes it's important to double that because when we have, we don't get fractions that way when we add in other elements. So it can either be SI411 or SI8022. Now, this is a double I beam, right? That's the tetrahedra viewed along the C axis. This would be looking down the C axis. So there's two different views here, right? So straight down the C axis, we see the doubled. Remember on uh, pyroxene, we only saw one of these chains. Now we have two chains linked together. And this would be looking, you know, this would be looking along the C-axis straight down. This would be looking the opposite direction. See, it shows C going this way. So this would be like looking down O or 100 or O10. Okay. Um, we have octahedrally. So this so the single chains, uh, we have octahedrally coordinated cations sandwiched between the T layers. Not any different than what we saw with the pyroxene, except it's a double chain wide, not a single chain. So you can imagine that where in pyroxenes we had two other sites to put atoms, we're going to have more sites to put stuff now because we have that double chain. So I said here, remember, the OH is going to go in the holes between the connected chains. So there's our OH, right? So there's that OH. So again, this is looking, this view here is the same as this. We're looking straight down the C-axis. And every color here is another site that we can put stuff. So we have the M1 site. We have the M2 site, the M3 site, the M4 site. We have the A site, which is what gets sandwiched between these double chains, and we have the place that we put OH. So not counting where the OH goes, we're going to have five different sites to put cations, which means some amphiboles have kind of ugly formulas. Okay, well, trying to make this make sense, again, we're looking down the C axis. There's the B axis. There's the A axis. So we're looking down C here. We're looking down C here. We have our double wide I beams. It's still a TOT, right? Tetrahedral, tetrahedral with octahedrally coordinated cations in between. TOT, just like the phyllosilicates. So now our I beams are double wide. So it sort of stretches our cleavages out to give us the one the, 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 the cleavage angles, the 126 uh, uh, and 54. Neat, huh? Um, and that's what gives that pyroxene that, that nice uh, angular cleavage. So five other structural sites besides where the OH goes that are produced between the chains by having all of this goodness. Okay. So all amphiboles will show that excellent 124 and 56 degree cleavage. Again, straight down the C-axis, straight down the C-axis. Here's the C-axis going this way, right? Those double I beams and showing you how the cleavage breaks between them. This one's a little rougher showing how the cleavage breaks between them. Here is an actual photo micrograph of horn blend showing that beautiful uh, cleavage. And when you see this, it's a moderate relief mineral, pleochroic, you know, you go, man, it's hornblende. And if you don't see this view, if you're looking on a, on a side view, then typically it will also show good pleochroism or it will show great cleavage and you will have at least this view somewhere, right? Here's a picture uh, of amphibole hornblende from the lab. And again, the bend here, this, this shadowed side, right, that's that, that's that 124 angle right there. So does it make sense now? Yeah. The double wide I-beams stretched out, so it goes from almost 90 degree cleavage between them to this 124 and 56. And then here inside, we can see all those M1, M2, M3, M4 sites and then we get those bigger sites stuck between the cations. And don't forget there's OH sh shoved in here too. 
and uh, it makes it a big garbage can. Okay. All right. So with all of that structural complexity, which isn't really that complex, it's just a lot of places we can put things, amphiboles become the most chemically complex group in nature. And what I told you earlier was that if you understand your amphiboles, they really, you can really tell things about temperature and pressure. Yeah. Okay, so the general formula for all amphiboles is this funky thing, W0 to 1, that's the W site, the X site, there's two of those, Y5, Z8, O22. Okay, well Z, you know, you see that, that's going to be silica in O22, right? So these are those other octahedral sites, and then you have the OH in here, which sometimes may not be OH, it may be fluorine. So look what goes in here. In the W site, we can have sodium or potassium. And that's in 10 to 12-fold coordination, right? Those are big honking atoms, and you got to put a lot of anions around them. The X site can have calcium, sodium, manganese, iron, magnesium, or iron. The Y site can have manganese, iron, magnesium, iron, aluminum, or titanium. And the Z site, which is again usually occupied by silica or silicon, can have silicon or aluminum. Well, look at all those variables. And when you start scrambling those, what you're going to get is a bunch of diversity, right? So there are five major groups of amphiboles leading to 76 chemically defined end member amphibole compositions. So let's say you were an amphibole expert. You're not going to be bored, right? You're going to have a lot to play with. And because of the wide range of chemical substitutions that are permissible, amphiboles can crystallize in a wide variety of igneous and metamorphic rocks, right, over a wide range. So that's why we see rocks in metamorphic world called amphibolites, you know, because they contain lots and lots of different kinds. You know, the amphiboles are, 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 are stable over a wide range of temperature and pressures because we can substitute so much stuff in there. But what makes them all in common? That water in there for one thing, right? Which is what separated them from the pyroxenes. Cool. Now, this is not something that I'm going to make you memorize, okay? I put it here because some of you are screenshotting this stuff and you want to save it for later. Some of you guys are going to go on and you'll never look at this again. Other, some of you will also go on to grad school and maybe this is something you're interested in. You can go back and go, hey, Terry taught us that. So, you know, there are calcium amphiboles, there are sodium amphiboles, there are can calcium and sodium amphiboles, and there are iron and magnesium amphiboles, and you have lots and lots of funny names here. If nothing else, you should be able to win at Scrabble, right? So, remember, amphiboles to you, almost an hour ago, were hornblende. We use them as synonyms in intro. Amphibole hornblende. Well, well, believe me, all amphiboles are not hornblende. I just told you that you can have 76 different, you know, amphibole minerals, right? So tremolite, ferroactinolite, hornblende, glaucophane, right? Rebakite, that's a bright blue one. Arfedzonite, richterite, anthophilite, and cummingtonite. And you know what? It, it, it just goes on from there. So I'll leave you with that. Now, we're not going to see all these amphiboles in mineralogy. What you're really going to see in mineralogy is some of the, the more basic ones. You're going to see hornblende. You're going to see tremolite, right? But, and you may see some of the sodium ones. But you will see some of these depending upon what your teacher gives you in petrology. So I did want to point out where some of these more basic ones form. Okay, so hornblende, most common variety of, for sure, because it, I didn't even show you a chemical diagram where all these things plot because it gets so complex. But hornblende is the only one I'm going to make you remember the formula for. Okay, and I put it on the last one and I put it here. Okay, but again, it's the only one that's got O22 and water. So, you know, it's not that hard to pick out. So hornblende, most common variety when you find igneous and metamorphic rocks. If you see something that you think is an amphibole, guess that it's hornblende unless it doesn't have any color. And if it doesn't have any color, you're going to guess that it's tremolite, right? Tremolite has calcium in it. 
and, and it tends to come from these metamorphosed dolomitic limestones. It's colorless. It's, it doesn't, it, it, it's, you know, so it's kind of white in hand specimen, colorless under the microscope. Actinolite is very, is like kind of medium green color, this pale green to pale blue green color, right? So actinolites. Hornblende is very deep, very strongly green and brown. Oxy hornblende, this is what you tend to find in intermediate volcanic rocks. It's red to orange color. But again, if you call it hornblende, you're going to be okay. Right? Anthophyllite, this is another metamorphic product that we see in ultramafic rocks. You know, when you metamorphose things like the mantle or you metamorphose things like, you know, basalts. Coming tonight, that's a, uh, another thing that we find in metamorphosed mafic rocks. Um, and then these sodic amphiboles, they're very beautiful. Bright blue and purple colors, really neat. Yeah, and rebakite, we tend to see these in pegmatites. So again, look at that. There's a huge range in everything from intermediate volcanic rocks to granites to metamorphosed mafic rocks. I mean, it, it's a wide variety. And why is that? Because the crystal structure allows in a lot of different substitutions. And so we're going to see a lot of different stabilities for these things. But they're neat minerals. They're not hard to identify under the microscope. Okay. Now, here's a, uh, another diagram I found for you. And this is somewhat like the one, a little bit simpler than that other one. But it's like, okay, let's take a look at extinction on prismatic grains. What's a prismatic grain? A prism is something that's long and slender. Okay. Longer and narrower, narrower than it is long, like, uh, like those laths of plagioclase, like a two by four would be a prismatic grain. So if you see a prismatic grain and it's got inclined and parallel extinction, then, then you go down and look and say, well, is it pleochroic? If it's strongly pleochroic and it's green, it's probably hornblende. If it's brown, it's oxyhornblende. If it's blue, it's rebakite or glaucophane. See, that's the way these guys do it. If, it's, if, it, if it has weak pleochrism and it doesn't have much birefringence and it, you know, well, maybe it's tremolite or it's activolite if it's green, right? What's the most important thing is, whatever mineral it is, you didn't call it pyroxene. You called it an amphibole. And if you get which amphibole wrong, hey, nobody's going to fire you over that. What we do as petrologists then is we might get a microprobe analysis and actually probe those things and then we can get an exact chemical formula for it, which allows us to place it. But certainly under the microscope, you need to be, you know, get, get it close, right? Get it close, which is what mineralogy will teach you. And then you'll go on and get more practice in petrology. But anyway, I hope I've impressed you with the fact that this is, these are some great minerals, lots of rocks, very common. And you're going to see them in lab, and they're pretty dang cool. All right, so here was the minerals you've had up until today. Boom, these are the minerals that you have. I will hold you responsible for. Instatite, MgSiO3, bronzite, FeSiO3. These are both orthopyroxenes. Diopside, ferrocylite, both clinopyroxenes. Well, astonite, that is a peroxenoid. Rhodonite, another peroxenoid. And then finally, hornblende, a amphibole. And of course, Mix and match all these different atoms in here with other stuff, and you can make all the other amphiboles. Well, that leads us to the end. And let's see, I don't have any framework silicates on here, but we went from framework, which think of it as like the big ball of tetrahedra all stuck together, because remember, it was all the corners were being shared. Then we went to sheets. Today we went to double singles and double chains, and next week we're going to the isolated tetrahedron, right? Those are the nesosilicates. So we only have a single tetrahedron, not the tetrahedra do not touch each other, right? So each silicon sees four oxygens and each oxygen only sees one silicon. So hey, see you next week for the final lecture. And uh, you'll have a little quiz next week as well for this week and next week. Have a great one. I will see you then.